Hey everyone, welcome to the Party Chat People's Podcast. We're back with another episode, and we're back with your favorite hosts, Mikey and Zavi, and me. Who are you? Yeah, don't tell yourself short, man. Yeah. Everyone knows me. I'm Steve. I'm the best part of this podcast. Oh, are you? Wow. Man? All right. <laughs> I guess Number we're one just shot. Stunner. <laughs> we're just shot zombies. How do we? How do we measure that? Are we gonna start we're... like comparing Twitter followers or like? Yes. Uh, attribution, uh, attribution, everyone attribution everyone knows no. tweets. number of tweets that lead to episode <laughs> plays and then your minutes. worth is measured in twitter followers total oh, tweets everyone knows that total total tweets total tweets <laughs> shit okay hold on now Dude. it's a race <laughs> in the future we're gonna have some digital implants on our arms where people just look around and they go Oh, ugh, 2,000 tweets. Get out of here. You remember that movie with uh, Justin that, Timberlake? That's called yes, I'm on in, his time, arm. Oh, yeah. in Time, yes. <laughs> I, yes I've yes. always wanted to watch it. I never got around to it. It's, but it's, I think I, that this is a podcast about video games. It is a podcast about video games. <laughs> Occasionally things, though. Specifically, uh, though, one video game today, as yes. opposed to the usual video game things. Uh, it the is last one video of game. Us 2, part 2. The Last of Us, part 2. And um, beware. Of us harder. Spoilers today. Uh, Many spoilers. For at least the first half of the game, I want to say. So if you are going to come here and try to avoid spoilers, uh, good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Because we we are an uncontrollable wreck. Yeah, we kind of have a loose, loose um, sort of rundown today. So we're going to take... The spoilers are going to get more intense over time. Yeah. (laughs) We're going to have the first half, about 25 minutes, just be, uh, you know, general talk about the game, what we're feeling, mechanics. And then the second half, about 25 minutes... (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> Gabe just Gabe just photobombed him. He did. We're he gonna have so surprised. Um, yeah, we're gonna have um uh the second half where we're gonna be a little bit more liberal with spoilers. Get more getting in depth with the story and maybe how Tales. some of the community has have reacted to some of the uh, story that Naughty Dog has so happily presented us with this yes. iteration. Um. So without further ado, I think we can just sort of get into it and say um. Well, I didn't really care for this game. <laughs> um, so, and, and let's also that. let's also be, try to be super clear, just to be transparent. Mikey has finished the game. I have. I am pretty far along, and Steve is a bit behind me. Um, um, I've been told I'm within spitting distance of mm. the midway point of the game. Okay. okay. So, uh, okay. take that as what you want. Okay. Um, but. I mean, for me, it's it's definitely a Last of Us game. You know, all the 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 mechanics you're familiar with from like the first game are there. The yeah. the atmosphere is there, which they do really really well. And I think that's one of the things for me that that makes it kind of stressful. Mm. I don't know about you guys. I have short play sessions because the the stress from the encounters in the environment like kind of gets me, and I got to take a breath every so often. Yeah, I I'm a suffi- I'm sufficiently engaged at this point in my playthrough that I am happily playing for many hours at a time. It's not exactly what I would call stressful personally, which was one of my fears was that this would just be some of the critiques where there's like, it's unbelievably bleak. It's never endingly bleak. And I don't agree with that. Um, It's very dark and very violent. uh, And that can be stressful, but on some level, like games are, so numbing and i think that's part of what this game can be about um but but even then even then it is next level i'm not talking about stress from a perspective of like the world itself i'm talking about from encounter to encounter you know Mm, yeah having the supplies of the game though yeah yeah yeah, yeah, the the stakes feel high in every encounter you know um ellie isn't that you know uh um, she's squishy in the sense of like you can only handle a couple of hits and once things start getting going it becomes very mounting to sort of handle more than you know a couple of enemies at a time um, definitely also true. a it, we, lot of this game that the, the difference is that you're alone by yourself right there was kind of a different feel when you were Joel and you had Ellie there to like kind of you know stab something in the background or you know, take something that was there that could have been a threat to you and, and take it out. This is a lot less of that now. Yeah. And uh, so it's just you relying on yourself and your ability to traverse each encounter. That is true. 
I think uh, the, the additional bit of context to, for so that we can contextualize our own comments and so that listeners can might be the difficulty that we're playing on, which is not mm -hmm. trivial because one of the best things about this game, in my mind, is granular difficulty. Yeah, it's probably, so many settings. probably it's the best yeah. I've ever seen. I am playing yeah. almost everything being Survivor. The right. only thing that I have knocked down to hard is the player difficulty, which I think I recommend to people who are very familiar with shooters, who like to fail, who like to be pressured in the economy. Um, but, you know, choose your own, right? Choose your own adventure. So yeah. Yeah. I right. like it's, the tension that it's is It's nice how they have it broken down by different sliders in the settings. Yes. So like, this is what you'll find and you have a metric for what changes that. It's yeah. not just, hey, it's harder now. It's yeah. you're gonna find less stuff or they definitely, you take um, more damage or the enemies are more hardy or, you know, all those yeah. things are there in a sort of sliding scale for you to see and determine how you're gonna, how you wanna play it. Mm -hmm. uh, so specifically for me, especially even if like, you play a lot of shooters this is still difficult because the guns have a real world kind of sway to them you know you only have a few bullets you have a maximum amount of bullets you can carry it's not like any shooter where you're like oh i'm just gonna hoard bullets hoard bullets hoard bullets and only use yeah. when i need them you can't it's just yeah. it's not gonna work that way and that's one yeah. of my favorite things about last of us one and two is they have a unique blend of shooter slash survival slash stealth um mm -hmm. and and it's their own unique blend and it's good it reminds me of those kind of a series of games uh i think uh, tomb raider the first reboot was one of them last of us part one was one of them uh mm -hmm. Metal Gear Solid Phantom Pain was another one which had Metal Gear Online, um, which I mentioned because all of these games actually had multiplayer components that helped showcase how they had this unique spin on a shooter that was their own, that was novel. Right. Part of the reason The Last of Us Part Two, gameplay-wise, is still good is because no one's competing with their specific blend. Right. They haven't no one... done a shitload to iterate on it. No one is going for that sort of real world feel to everything, right? Um, and it's it's Naughty Dog, so we know they've come from a place with Uncharted where it was kind of spectacle for everything. Yeah, they can do arcade -y. And here they are taking that and making it feel very real world in a lot of ways with how much you can hold, you know? Like a backpack only holds so much. You're not gonna fill a backpack to the top with bullets. It's just no. not realistic, yeah. you know? And yeah. one of the things that first pointed me to that is um, very early on in the game uh, you find a gas can and the gas can does not fit in her backpack so she mm -hmm. kind of tries to shove it in and then you just have the spout of it sticking out yeah it's yeah kinda, it's That's just one point. of those like little details that they do throughout the game yeah. that like really definitely make it feel like a more real approach yeah to one thing that i that i need to give this game credit for um is that they are doing the thing that red dead redemption 2 was praised for doing in a better context what right, i mean yeah. is the animations are like very handcrafted it's literally like yes. the hand going to the object and picking it up the backpack has the little details like the spout coming out there's all these little realism touches here and there that are not insignificant they matter the fact that crafting takes time the fact that um you don't necessarily want to craft immediately right. at least i don't because sometimes you go into encounter you don't know what you need. you don't know what you need yeah yeah and that adds this tension that is very smartly designed so that's it. a lot of that's carry over from the first game stick to the minor details portion real quick because yeah. like like you said the, the the hand moving to grab something but if you notice if there's multiple things there you can spam the triangle button and they'll alternate hands to pick stuff up it's a yep, really yeah. just cool minor detail as opposed to like just making it disappear because the animation isn't fast enough. And it's a good middle ground because Red Dead Redemption 2 was actually just like annoying in, yeah. the, in like, here's a drawer. I'm it was also here. slower. The animations right. were slower, but they do skip over some stuff when you pick over, um, pick up, excuse me, items that you eat. You don't see yeah. an eating animation. Sure. <laughs> the yeah. the bar yeah. just goes up. Or if you want, you hold down triangle and you basically just swoop everything in the area. Yeah. And yeah. Swoop, right. And then you have yeah. like the mirrors. They're like full mirrors throughout the game that, you know, you can just stand in front of and see the kind of reflection where like, if it's a section where you don't really need to take out your gun and you hold that left trigger, you'll actually see Ellie squint 
as the like small zoom in happens. Yeah. And then like There's you a, have the detail of, of the stealth kills where I don't know if you guys panned your camera around when you're doing the stealth I have. kill. Yeah. And you see like see the, the, the effort on their face too. Uh-huh. Yeah. Just going into like the and the facial animation. Yeah, the animations and for the face and the are like really good. <laughs> and the differences between how uh first big spoiler coming in two seconds, how uh Abby plays differently from Ellie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those are important. Um I think that you cannot knock them on, on detail. However, to take a critical turn. Uh, I think I mentioned off podcast. I can't even keep track of time anymore. Um, from next spoiler, from mm-hmm. the moment that uh, that your horse goes kaboom, to the end of day one was a slog. I did not enjoy it. Yes, it, those it details did not matter. Now, there's an argument to be had for the slog was part of the point, but. I felt like a child that the game was trying to be clever and tell me that like violence is bad. And I kind of walked into this game, like knowing that violence is bad. So I don't know why this game is lecturing me about how violence is bad. uh, As so the game is broken down in, you know, spoiler alert, because we might start getting into uh, that separation where we can't separate mechanics from the story because given how the narrative of the game works. So if you don't want to hear spoilers, you know, probably turn this off, come back at a later date when you're ready to listen to this discussion, um, because now we're getting to a point where it's kind of difficult to pull those two apart. That being said, like you said, after um, Shimmer, uh, the horse, you have that one segment in day one that's kind of open worldy. Right, before that. And then it sort of just stops that. So yeah. I kind of liked the idea and how they played with the map where Ellie was drawing on the map and there's a question mark there and yeah. then you go visit it, you take what you need and you're like, all right, we'll cross this off the map. I really wish they kind of stuck with that more. Yeah. So but Because I really liked how that played out as sort of like, you know, it's a risk reward thing. Do you go here, try to get the supplies you need or do you not risk it because you could come back with less? And for me, it's it was all about like world building. I enjoyed right. that part because... I think it was a smart thing to do because a there's a player choice and some people are just going to be like let's go do the thing and I was just like no I want to learn about what's going on and and you do you are rewarded with that too by doing exploring in that stage right the um my issue to is that Naughty Dog is doing this in a lot of their games now where they have like one level mm-hmm. that they're like, look, it's kind of open world. and Specifically the Uncharted 4 level where you're in the Jeep? So there's the Uncharted 4 <laughs> level where you're in the Jeep. I haven't played that game. There's the Uncharted DLC, which has a segment in it that is also like, go to all these corners in whichever yeah. order you want. Is that the... Uh, the Lost Legacy. Lost that Legacy. One, yeah. I have it installed. Um, I haven't played it yet. That's pretty good. You can finish okay. it in an afternoon kind of thing. Oh, and okay. then now they're doing it here. And I think that like... If, if it's not sustainable, then maybe like bookend it in a smarter way, but yeah. it just feels a little goofy because it's, it's like, just, oh, is the game going to be this? And it's like, no, no, the game is not going to be it this. It feels out of place. Like it was an yes. idea they started with and then they were like, uh, well, just leave it in and keep going. Maybe. Yeah. I, 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 because if you set me up for that, I think I was like, oh, wow, it's going to be great. I'm going to explore everything. I'm going to have this map, you know. And then you have the map that you turn over and there's more to it. And it's all of a sudden like, oh, well, there's more yeah. than that. And, and it's and a it's... matter of presentation and scale because yeah. it's not fair to say that the game suddenly becomes on rails. That's not true. The no. game is more open than the first game. That is one of the unambiguous good job improvements. Uh, nothing bad to be said about the level design and how it's um, broader. There's the... usually a few ways to get around spaces and in particular in combat encounters that matters a lot specifically encounters that happen outdoors in the grassy areas because i think what they did with the grass it works really well i haven't had a portion of that where i feel like the grass is glitchy like i feel like i shouldn't have been found out all the things that work in those new sort of tall grass kind of situations i think works really well nice yeah, I think that's fair. That was probably the first the first fight that made me basically be like, 
uh, excuse me, that basically made me go like, okay, this feels better than most yeah. of what came before it was the tall grass in the middle of like the city of Seattle. Uh, that was good. But it also brings up that that was the second instance of something that I saw coming that is annoying me on a, I can't think of a better term other than like metatextual, but the short version is this story again, it feels like it's treating me like a baby, but in a very specific way, which is, oh, these groups that Ellie is trying to get revenge on, they're going to do bad things to her, which makes you as a player be like, it's justified, it's justified. So RIP Shimmer. And then the moment that I heard the whistles, I was like, oh, okay, it's time for us to meet the scars. Yes. And the moment that I did that, I was like, they're going to attack first because I know how the storytelling works in this game. And as much as it's infuriating, this game isn't going to give me a, like an option to behave nonviolently. And that's right. annoying because as, as someone who has a bit of a connection with Ellie, AKA anyone who played the first game is a player. Mm -hmm. Like I don't want her to do this shit. Like she's being stupid. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, know. but I, is I there think... evidence for her that from the previous game to show that, yeah, she is a stupid kid? Where have we seen her growth? Where have we seen her maturity for us to say, like, oh, we think this is the way she's supposed to act, but maybe this is how she really is? Um, a lot. I haven't played the game, the first game in a long time. So I don't really recall any moments of Ellie, like, growing up besides being like the comic book loving kid that she was who like had kind of a shitty situation thrust upon her. And I mean, if I'm not that, mistaken, wasn't there some situations where she ran away or, you know, um, right. she did some silly things. So all I'm saying is, is there anything in the story or the lore to show that she's matured? Yes, she's grown up, but that doesn't necessarily mean that someone right. matured I, and how you well, convey that. I don't think there is because I, I, one, I didn't play the DLC and two, I haven't played the first game in a long time. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't like recall it off the top of my head, but even just from from that going to not playing the first game in a few years, to jumping into this game and not playing the DLC, it's like I haven't really seen anything of Ellie. As far as I can tell, all she is is taller. Mm -hmm. So so there was some growth in that first game in my mind. However, this is a totally new context because there's no sense in dancing around it anymore. We've had plenty of spoiler moments, right? Like. This is the death of Joel, and it's gruesome, and it's framed in an interesting way at the beginning of the game. I like that part at the, the at the beginning of the game and the way they framed it and played with your perspective and stuff. Um, you like nothing from the first game informs how she might react if a father figure like died, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's clear from the actions that she takes in the second game that she's essentially just drunk with anger. And I do think that the game does a good job of occasionally like trying to invite you, the player, to check in on like whether what Ellie's doing is good. But the extent to which you play as her felt, again, like I was being babied. Um, and, and again... And, and, and as far as players, um, like they how might... they... Is that in as far as how they treat encounters? Or is that in as far as the game telling you this is how you should approach this situation? Um, I actually think it's more subtle than that. So so one of my favorite little ways that they're doing this in my mind is with the trading cards. Okay. They're one of the smartest collectibles I've ever seen in a game. I'm not a completionist. I could give two fucks about collecting all the things, mm -hmm. but... I do like to read them. They're good to read. It's good writing. And it's also never random. You pick up those cards very often after a story beat has hit that contextualizes this fictional character in what Ellie is doing. And in particular, sometimes you feel like you pick up a card and you go, oh, this is her. And sometimes you pick up a card and you, and you might feel like, oh, this is the WLF or so and so on. And, and, and explicitly on the bottom of all the cards, because remember, this is the in-universe fantasy Marvel universe type thing. There's an explicit meter on the bottom that says villain to hero. And, and it that has is, neutral portions too. And it has neutral portions too. And that is essentially, in my mind, making fun of the binary morality that games have played with a lot. I actually think there's one specific card that comes to mind for me. I don't know if you found it. Was The, the villain's name was Esquire. 
I don't think I so. Basically, that. he was a uh, he was a lawyer. He was like a, a DA or something like that, and he lost pretty much all of his cases. So he turned to actually going down and hunting those that were accused of crime, and because they didn't get sentenced, he would go and take justice into his own hand. So I think that that one really parallels kind of that that situation, mm -hmm. right? Because and was he labeled as a hero? He was, I think it was like neutral villain neutral. or something. It was somewhere yeah. in the middle, where, but he was still leaning towards villain. Mm. And it's interesting because um, a lot of people, you know, spoiler, we talked about spoilers. So I'm not going <laughs> to preface anything anymore. The death of Joel hits you pretty hard because you spend a lot of time as Joel. And, you know, that's kind of like your quote unquote, main, one of the main characters of your series. You cannot he, be in the shoes of a character and not right. feel like you're them. Right. And you have Joel and his death, and it's it's not some grandiose thing. It's pretty just it's revenge. And it's is, also is what it is. And, you know? and I think the way they set up those dominoes is really yeah. expert. Um, like That's, this yeah. is the one good part of the ending of Death Stranding, except in several key points throughout the story so far. Like they so, they really are crafting this really well. So the moment when Joel says, "Y'all sound like you've heard of us." Yes, that was that was there. the line that made me go, oh, and yes. then immediately afterwards. Yes, and it takes and it's and it is immediately as soon as he finishes that sentence, it's like they punched Tommy with the gun. Mm -hmm. So for me, and then it kind of comes back around to like, okay, so you know it's a revenge story for Ellie, and then where I am in the game now, I've just got a character turn where I'm not Ellie, I'm Abby now, and they backtracked initially to four years earlier at the St. Mary's Hospital, which is the cause, the kickoff for um, Abby's revenge plot. Joel kills the doctor. The very first person you kill at The Last of Us at the hospital is the doctor. And because remember, Joel walks into the room. Yeah, he, yeah. he's the one that defends trying to defend the, the surgery. So you kill yeah. the doctor. And so they kind of like gave a backstory to the doctor here that it's Abby's dad. Uh, and then they fill out this thing with Marlene and the doctor saying that the only way to get the vaccine and the cure is to kill the host. Yeah. And it turns into this discussion of Marlene really doesn't want to do it. So there you've got your turn for Marlene and saying, oh, she wasn't as bad as she was in the first game the way we thought. She wasn't as bad as she was framed. Framed. Right, framed. Game. So you have that. And then you have Joel killing the doctor because he wants to save Ellie. And then all of a sudden now it's like, oh, shit. Now you have the impact of what people have been saying about Joel from the beginning, right? And it's so what now I've it complicates your feelings on him, which it, I really liked. But it yeah. also shows, it goes back into the, the revenge is a cycle thing, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Joel killed the doctor. The doctor's daughter came after Joel. Now Ellie's going after the, daughter, the doctor's daughter. It's, and it's all this, the people and all the collateral damage in between. Yeah. And that's a decent meditation. I just think that there's like five to eight hours that could have been cut. Yeah. Um, the um, the the journey from the journey for maybe most players from Joel is nice man father figure to Joel is not so nice man question mark. Like I don't know how long that ought to take. Let's say right mm -hmm. for me that was like five minutes into the story uh, because the intro to this game does something that I think is very smart, which is it starts with Joel telling Tommy the events of the first game, particularly yes. the last few scenes. And they do it in a way that I think I could talk about for far too long and I won't do it right now. And it really makes you start questioning whose story is this and, and, and who's the unreliable narrator. In my mind, the entire first game could be Joel telling Tommy what happened, which makes me question everything that I saw in the first game, kind of. And also puts me in Ellie's shoes because I don't know if I believe this motherfucker. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, now you know, that's just me. I was like very quickly into the game. I was just like, Joel, I don't know about you, which was part of how the first game left me with in the first place. Right. So for yeah. me, you, you talk about... Um how this like they could have saved like five hours right so i'm seeing that myself i'm seeing a lot of the game where i'm like this is unnecessary i shouldn't have to do this like i can you can remove like a ton of these encounters 
and still have the same impact from yeah. your narrative. You can still have everything flowing. It just takes a little less time. Yeah. So it, it feels like it's almost inflated just to pad out the gameplay to be like, oh, this is our 30 yeah. hour experience. I but found reality, myself losing a lot of interest. Um, you can give through, me everything that you gave me in 10 hours. Yeah, just through the sheer number of the encounters. I just found myself like, why am I doing this? Like the revenge seems to get a little less um, impactful with yeah. each murder that you yes. know you yes. take along yes. the way. Even Which the group of friends feeling. that she has. It um for us maybe. No, not uh, like a fun fun feeling. I mean that that's um, a crafted, smart thing for them to do and it still takes too long. Yeah. And even even then, um it kind of disconnects me from the story. Yeah. Because it's like it's like, oh my god, look at all these chest high walls that are here. <laughs> mm. Oh yeah, man. There's, gonna here. there's gonna be a fight. And then it's like, yeah. well, now I'm not worried about the narrative. I'm worried about getting past this encounter to yeah, continue right. the narrative. So it kind yeah. of jumps between these two things. And it doesn't, as yeah. much as the narrative is part of the, the, the mechanics and stuff, yeah. it also disconnects in a really un, and, like, uninviting way for me. I just yeah. I don't like it. And it doesn't do it for me. I felt, I felt like the game and definitely even the way in its geometry, well, when, it, when the seam started to unravel for me, at least it just seemed like every beginning to a day was the same of like okay we leave here you have your intro stores that guitar. you go in you you go through your stores you get your supplies then you go to the encounters then you just and then that's it it's like every every day just start sort of started the same way and it just it's just like this is just the game of like oh we just saddle up get everything we go to our destination rinse and repeat and, i found the mechanics and sort of the game flow a little bit I was surprised that that's what um, Naughty Dog sort of relied on. I thought it would be a lot more organic. Yeah, and to add to that, um, every day, like you like you said, every day you start, and it's just which hallway are you going down today? Yeah, you know. And the, as the chapters progress, there's never a return back to the movie theater. It's always just a big jump cut back all uh -huh. the way. That's you understandable. Know? I it's, guess. It, yeah, they could have mixed is. up the they could have mixed up the structure, right? Right, yeah. because you don't have to give me a dramatic moment and then cut back to the movie theater each time, right? right. Like something dramatic doesn't have to happen. And it's like jump cut to here's our four hours of traveling back where we could have done some character development instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Speaking, so, speaking of jump back, uh, just uh, actually you can finish up Zabi, but I wanted to switch to uh, a more important character that we've just sort of skipped all over, which is Dina. Dina. Yeah. yeah, since yeah. you mentioned them... Um, the movie theater. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Oh. You're, 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 What's that? that? Is making sense. Is that you? It's not me. I don't think it's me. Not me. <laughs> Mikey. Oh. Anyway, so Dina, sounds. that's we're me. gonna ignore them. Dina <laughs> so, comes along with you. Hold on. Let me. Let me uh, give me two seconds. So, I think that um, in terms of the structure of day one, day two, day three, I'm mostly okay with that. But the problem is the disconnect. Right? You can play with Ludo narrative dissonance and the fact that I, as a player, am not aligned with the character that I'm playing. Um, that's fine. Other games have done it better than the first half of this game. Spec, Spec Ops The, the line. line. Thank you. Um, uh, um, to some extent, even though it's still guilty of a lot of the things that I have problems with this game, Bioshock Infinite. Um, mm -hmm. Like, there are other games that do this better, that have pulled it off better. The, for me, the problem just boils down to, like, it. the game really seems to think that I am going to have trouble realizing that killing people is bad mm. and and for how much they clearly are good at production values it's almost like they don't have faith that killing someone in this game is a is like not fun yeah right so they make you do uh, it so yeah let me let me add on to that one thing because to, to add to that yeah they try to shoehorn down this killing is bad thing um and they do it in a couple of ways i don't know if you guys had this experience, but I was in, um, there's an area where you're going through a bunch of houses and there's a bunch of uh, WLF soldiers that are looking for you right before you uh, run into Jesse again. Mm. And um, there's this, there was this one moment I had where the last person alive, I had not been stealthy in it. Uh, I actually alerted somebody and then she was the last one alive. And as I'm running up to her, uh, she was kind of like begging like, oh no, stop, stop, stop. And then it like, there was an option there for something, but I don't know what it was for. So. Um, I think the only option you have, because I've triggered that sort of dynamic a few times, Yeah. the only choice you really have is to move on as quickly right. as possible or 
you're going to have to fight them. And that's and, and that right. I find irritating because um, the same way that I have trouble relating to and giving a shit about Ellie as she continually does stupider and stupider things, which again, Ludo narrative dissonance, not like not inherently bad. You can do that. Um, I th like it's worse for me almost when they do it to NPCs. So I just murdered like nine of your friends and now you're surrendering and I'm not shooting you in the face. Mm. Why would you re-engage? Right. Other yeah. than the game designers are being stupid. Yes. That takes me out of the experience more than most things, actually. So then, the, and then the next point I was going to point out was, um, what was her name? Nora? Was Nora yes. the one that you chased through the, uh, the, the hospital? There? Yeah. Yeah. The so you chased her there. through there. And I really liked that sequence. That chase was fantastic. And I just yeah. liked that the stakes of, of running through an infected area and you got the clickers that had come out and, if you manage to distract them well enough, they'll kill those soldiers that come down to look for you. Yeah. That being said, you catch her and the game kind of forces you into the situation of like beat her to death. Right. Right. But it does it in a way where it's like, come on, you know, you want to come on, come on. If it that's what Ellie's going to do for your narrative, then just have her do it. Yeah. I agree. I think there should me. be, I think there should be a timeout where she does it anyway. Yes. Um, and, 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 and those details matter to me because some of my favorite gaming moments, one of my favorite gaming moments includes Metal Gear Solid 3 when they force you to shoot the boss. Mm -hmm. That was a better version of that idea where it's like, we're going to make you push the button because in Metal Gear Solid 3, by the time they brought me to that point, I did not want to push that button. Now, in this game, it's like, yeah, you don't want to push that button, but Ellie does, which again, little narrative dissonance, that's fine. Right. But... And, and, and they're smart enough to actually do uh, – so, so so they're not smart enough, whatever, to give you the option to not press the button, and then Ellie does it anyway, which I would have liked. But they also are smart enough to cut away and do something brilliant, okay, which is we do not see Ellie get the information that she's after. Right. Instead, yeah. you press the button three times, which is brutal. And after I pressed it one time, I pressed it the second and third time pretty fast because at that point, I as a player was like, you know what? I'm putting Nora out of her misery because this is what the game is making me do. And then you cut to black and you find out that she did get the information and you see the look on Ellie's face. And actually, that was very scary and terrifying because, oh, we did not see the worst that she did. That mm. was my takeaway from that. And I think that like it's this weird disconnect where they know how to write things and they know how to show things and hide things, but I don't think they have a particularly sophisticated take on how to roll player agency into it. Yeah. I think yeah. that's that's where, where I kind of got I don't want to say annoyed, but like it was one I'm, of those things where it's like it marked something off in your head where it's like, okay, the button is there. It's obviously gonna happen. There's no way out of the situation. It's not like you're giving me a choice. You're just pausing the game at that point. You can and that's where it take, feels like they're babying you, can, you. Yeah, you can take that out of there because we know what Ellie wants. Yeah, We know what Ellie's trying to do. It's the whole reason this game started is because Ellie wants her revenge. I yeah. mean, I, I think um, a more interesting take would have been like, say maybe she cornered her in like a kitchen area and maybe she, as she's beating her, you get like a piece of information and then she's crawling and like you get to see okay this is the levels and and the length she's with to torture someone to get it it's sort of like you kind of like okay we did all of this and then you cut to black so like what was the point it's like we did all this for nothing and you're just going to mark it on a piece of paper and you're like yeah okay now it's time to move on and it made that the part of that revenge seem less impactful like yeah these people are just pawns so when the character switch did happen and even though you're like oh okay I can see these people in a different light and all this stuff is just like, well, there's nothing really behind them because they die so pointlessly. <laughs> You're just like, okay, whatever. I disagree with you on that if I understand you correctly. I think that that is the right way to handle this structurally because mm -hmm. you have at this point made the players complicit-ish in what Ellie has done now we're going to show you these people's lives. That is a better impact to make people feel and think through these cycles of violence than if they mixed it up, in my opinion. I think opinion. specifically maybe they didn't do a good job of giving uh, the, the other team 
more to work with. I mean, maybe that might be Nora and a couple of the characters. Um, remember, she, well, she has a hit list, so I don't think it's a spoiler to say anything. But you know, the the characters that they you they devote more time to, you're like, hmm. Yeah. Even after I know their unlikely demise, I'm still not satisfied with the complexity that she displayed to me with these characters. They're kind of just like, okay, we've spent five hours explaining about mark we've spent five hours explaining about jerry we've spent five hours about explaining you know thomas but at the end of the day i really didn't care about them to begin with so you've kind of just wasted that might have played into the um sort of time aspect of like it feels like we're doing you you wasted too much time with other characters that well, no one really, really cares about care I, about any of them um, even now, like Abby just kind of kind of feels like a one note character to me. She doesn't uh, have any. Sure. Well, right now I'm just sure, switched sure, over sure. to yeah, Abby. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know, I barely have anything on her besides that she wanted revenge, and I'm, I'm starting to get more. You know, yeah. I, you see in the dialogue that's coming that she's like a decent person. They have a nice little settlement there in the stadium, like mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. But for me, it's like the the first half of this game that I've played, she's just kind of been a name, right? Like, and and that's that's good because they're putting you in Ellie's shoes and right. you know very little about her except she killed Joel. And I'm okay with that except for the length. I think that again, like overall structure wise, I don't think I would change anything yet. Mm. But I do think that um, I was already ready. Like, and, and this isn't saying the game should have shaken it up, maybe shortened Ellie's part, but I was already ready to learn about Abby's side of the story, I was ready to learn about Owen's side of the story, I was ready to learn about Mel's side of the story, I was ready to learn about everyone's side of the story personally. And, you know, I like what I'm getting at this point where I'm at, and I think that they could have done more. Like, the, the five or whatever hours that they cut, like, could have been another character could have been a scars character i don't yeah, and know I, mm. like, I think that's where my big issue comes with it is this, this the time sync portion of it and i think that's kind of where i, I kind of like lose start losing it right i kind of lose interest in the story i kind of lose interest in just going from encounter to encounter it's like if this is what i wanted you know i could play any number of games that just have replayable missions in them you know just to mm. shoot stuff and kill zombies or whatever the case may be so like yeah. padding out a game just to get a um, a blurb that says, "Oh, check out our thirty-hour campaign." Yeah, it, it, it's. I think it's losing things for me along the way. You know, yeah. a lot of people get upset when they find out a campaign is only six to eight hours or something like that. But it doesn't have to be thirty, and it doesn't have to be padded out with stuff just because you can't. It find doesn't more have stuff to be to a full price game. Mm-hmm. Like that's the like. I understand that you know it was always going to be and all that. I'm just saying there are other possibilities. Yeah. The, um, what I want to get into a little bit is, um, yeah, the uh, WLF characters are a little bit um, not as super developed and whatnot. Let's get into some of the other Jackson characters and what they're doing and how it contrasts with Ellie. Because yeah. I think there's some good work being done there, particularly in the voice acting and the writing, where a lot of these characters, I think, are pretty aware that Ellie is being fucking stupid. Oh yeah, so, I think, yeah. and I think they voice it too, on yeah. occasion. Specifically, um, Jesse, I think, has those moments with her, yeah. where he's, even when they're going to go look for Tommy, and she's like, "Yeah, let's go get Tommy and leave," and then all of a sudden, oh, there's the aquarium, and Abby might be there, and he's like, "But we said we were going to get Tommy and leave." She's like, "Yeah, but Tommy's probably headed there," and, and he could, be, and he'll, and then she, she rationalizes like, "He's fine anyway," and you're just like, "Wait." Why did we come all this? Yeah, it, yeah. I was revealing that Ellie was full of shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's and that's the thing. It was a good writing kind of thing because it's important and engaging, and not in a like gameplay engaging, but like I like what Jesse's doing, uh, yeah. sort of way. It's to see their interaction because Jesse's like, I want to get clear on one thing. If we get Tommy, we go back to Jackson, right? And Ellie's just like, yeah. And, like, in that moment, I actually kind of bought that she felt that in that yes, moment. Yes, me too. Yeah. But I think that the moment that she has a choice to make, that's when, possibly to herself, it's revealed that she is full of shit. Yeah. And she mm-hmm. is revenge drunk, and she is going to go continue doing stupid shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's mostly fine. 
However, I think, and I don't know, like obviously the ending has a huge sway in what I'm about to say. This game does not so far particularly punish Ellie for what she is doing. And this no. is the problem with having like realism, but then having the plot armor that comes with being the main character in a video game. Like, I like how Jesse dropped because very few bits of media have done this. And I actually always appreciate when it's appropriately um, staged that when someone dies and it's someone that you care about and have grown to go interest in, it's not this dramatic slow motion thing. It is a bullet and then they drop. Yes. And that is traumatizing as fuck. So the Jesse I, thing was done really well. That was the, done, I it, think. And, really it's, well. and it's just done. They it's don't just, go back to it. They don't look at it. There's no you get reflection. get one good shot so that it's yep. like no ambiguity. Yes. He is fucking dead. And then that's it. And you like Jesse because Jesse's kind of this reasonable voice throughout the, the yeah. first half of the game. You yeah. know, even when you first meet him, uh, Ellie and him are talking about Dina and how they used to date. And, and even they're being then, reasonable about it. Yeah, and he's being reasonable. He's like, I first like, are. wait, you're, you're dating Dina? And then he's like, relax, I'm kidding. Yeah. And then it's just, he just goes into this really casual thing. So Jesse is kind of like this really positive character in Ellie's life. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's one of the, one of those characters in, in this universe that's a main character that you're just kind of like, man, that guy's just a good dude. Yeah. And, and, and he's not dancing around Ellie's, he's not talking down to Ellie, which is actually important because right. if he tried to yell at her, it would just make her push him away and, and, and he cares about her as a friend. And there's some yeah. sincerity to his line about my friend's problems are my problems. Right. He wants to walk her back off the edge. I think that's yeah. very clear. And he never, yeah, he never does it in a condescending way. To, he doesn't. That. He, he, he always just that talks moment. to her like a person. He reaches yeah. that moment in the action when he's like, I'm going to go get Tommy. And you see it in his face where he's just like, I'm kind of disappointed in you, but yeah, do you? Yeah. I yeah. think the juxtaposition of uh, Dina and Jesse match with Ellie is really good just to show like, hey, there's these three friends that have this really good relationship. And Dina tries to support Ellie in a way to sort of bring her down the edge. And Jesse comes along and sort of supports, also brings in that extra flavor of like, how am I going to like sort of with Dina slowly bring Ellie back from the edge. As you can see, they right. both fail, but they try in their own ways to just be like, hey, wait a second. You know, uh, I'm Ellie, more critical we, we, of no, Dina. We, we, I feel um, for, for me, Dina isn't really important anymore. All she's been is stuck in the movie theater where she hasn't really brought anything to the table since getting there. Well, she symbolizes something. Yeah, she symbolizes a few different things. Broadly, though, she symbolizes a future. A and future, Ellie is yeah. looking at, here's what the future can be. Here's someone who I love. She is pregnant. Yeah. So that is a future of a sort that could be there, either shared with Jesse or whatever. Yeah. And all of that is something that Ellie is ignoring. Yep. Because she's revenge drunk. And yeah. there have been, there's been a, the consequence of Jesse. Maybe there will be the consequence of Tommy or Dina. I don't know yet. And like, I, I, if 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 those things are true, and it punishes Ellie from that perspective, I really hope the game doesn't like make this a shocking like sort of thing. Like on some level, I will just be there going like, yeah, you kind of had it coming. Yeah, sorry, girl. This is tragic, but like, I I'm not mad at at Abby. I'm not mad at the wolves. Um, it's a complicated world, but like, you had every fucking opportunity. Mm, yeah. Um. Again, this doesn't help the the pounds and pounds of people she kills to get to <laughs> to get her revenge. And again, it's, it's a, a very it's basic. Padding, it's padding out the thing with just more bodies, right? It's it's a basic thing. I don't think that like like game designers and and, and game writers are thinking enough about the body count. It's really that simple, right? Yeah. Like at a, at a, at a more um, um, pedagogical level, like you have the ridiculous example of the 24 video game where within a level you, you kill more people than a season of 24. And that's dumb 
and it doesn't work, and it's a type of ludonarrative dissonance. And it's weird because they've had this kind of criticism before with the Uncharted series, right? Yeah. Like in the first one, you killed a very specific type of enemy. In the second one, you killed a very specific type of enemy. It's not new to Naughty Dog in any way, so it's like, well, we've said to you, like, hey, Nathan Drake kind of kills a lot of people. You know, he kills an entire PMC worth of people in, I think, just one game. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, like maybe walk it back a little bit because you're going for that kind of more realistic vibe. You want yeah. the 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 body count to kind of reflect the internal turmoil of the character. Right. So bring it down. I mean, Bioshock, so it the more. first one, did a good job of like every bad guy in that game is a thing. Right. And you don't even, you're not even really asked to empathize with them, really. But yeah. it's still like, like it just goes to show that the gameplay is possible where every enemy is like a fucking thing. Right. But what I'll say is um, we have had games from a narrative perspective lecture us about how killing is bad to varying degrees of like success, Spec mm-hmm. Ops, Bioshock, the first one, Bioshock Infinite, etc. Something that's starting to like not just get old but just actively piss me off now is when game designers are trying to have their cake and eat it too like we're gonna tell a revenge tale and it's not gonna be fun but it's gonna be engaging and it's gonna have blockbuster like production values but also you're gonna have a lot of like engagement in the mechanics and we're gonna spend so much time crafting these mechanics to make killing them very interesting oh you want us to make more sophisticated ai so that you can empathize better with the enemy soldiers no that's hard Mm-hmm. And even, yeah. even then, there's no like, uh, there's no off button for the enemies, right? There's no moment where they're like, they don't run. Where they're not gonna yeah. run. Yeah, exactly. They're not gonna run. They're not gonna back down. They're just gonna keep looking for you, and they're gonna continue on that path to look for you to engage with you. It's never like a more human side to these people. So you have this juxtaposition of the enemies keep coming for you when they're wolves. But then we're going to show how good the wolves are by showing you their environment in the stadium. Yeah, and look at their nursery juxtaposed with the Jacksonville nursery, right? right. Like, yeah. okay, game, I'm aware that they're humans who ha- probably had a life. Now, do something with the gameplay, maybe? Yeah. Just show me that, like, maybe they are interested in survival more than just hunting down the one girl who's gunning for their leader. And and that's, like, the problem with uh, being, like, too fuckery with ludonarrative dissonance is that at some point I just go, actually, the text of your game is not empathetic to these people. Your cutscenes are. Mm. And and to go back to my point of just the stress of the encounters, yes, the, because the game is so atmospheric, the encounters stress me out. But then at a point I'm just like, all right, well, I'm tired of going from Human encounter, infected encounter. Human encounter, infected encounter. Oh, here's both. Great. Human encounter, infected encounter. Human encounter. Like, I don't want to keep running into chest high walls and knowing sure. that it's going to be infected this time because there are spores in the air. You know? I, I will say that I think that is mitigated in my experience by playing on a high difficulty. Um, the game is definitely engaging, and that does something for the dramatic moments that they try to handle. So one very specific thing to call out is... A lot of games have dismemberment. A lot of games have, like, gore. This game has gore that surprises me. And not that it surprises me because it's there, but because I'm so caught up in the mechanics of, like, trying to survive and perform well Mm -hmm. that the moment comes when I take a sniper shot and I notice just because of the, the, like, animation or what happens to the model that I just severed that arm. It is now flying in the air, and that person is bleeding. Mm -hmm. Now, from a gameplay perspective, I have succeeded in taking that person out of the equation, but they will be screaming for the next five to ten seconds before they pass out and then eventually bleed out and die. That is affecting. That is well done. And it's directly proportional to your actions. It's a response to your actions. And it's totally fair to say you did it to survive, but also it's in the context of a story where you're not given the choice to not fight. Right. Um, yeah. But I, th- I think more for me, it's just how um, knowing when an encounter is coming, just, and I, maybe that's just a video game thing in you now at this point where it's like reading oh, the level design. Yeah, reading the level design, like, oh, there's an encounter coming. God, another one. I just kind of wish the story would get to the story beat. 
Yeah. You know, and it's sort of that's where it disconnects for me, you know? Yeah. And I stopped playing because I'm like, oh, another encounter. Like I've been playing for like two hours and here's another encounter. And I just kind of want to get to the next story beat to see what's going on. Like, and give they me that. do, they do the uncharted. Oh, the rock, hand, the rock hold fell. They do that, mm-hmm. a, you know, a good handful of times. <laughs> I think that this actually game. just happened with me in the arcade. Oh, um, <laughs> sure. Trying to get the boat through. And then uh, there's the, what is it? A, the bloater? The bloaters uh, are the big, heavy, the yeah. ones, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Fall through the ground in a bloater. I'm like, oh, and no, in my head, like five minutes before that happened, I was like, oh, here, well, I'm, I'm like, we're about due for me to fall through yeah. something and yeah. encounter a bloater. Yeah, <laughs> I, I heard, I heard the wood creak. I, would, yeah. I heard the wood creak like three seconds before you fall through, yeah. and I was, and I heard it, and I was just like, this is gonna be bad. <laughs> I. I, I was just thinking of it. I'm like, all right, well, this is kind of and a big I'm okay area. With, I'm okay with foreshadowing. I'm okay, I'm okay with, with foreshadowing. I'm o- but like, uh, I'm okay with I think throw it, yeah, throw it to me in a different kind of way. Yeah. And not so, do it the same. Because the bloaters seem to be this thing every time where it's like, you just happen upon them. Like something uh, breaks yeah. and you fall in or like in the hotel, mm-hmm. you, you get pulled through the wall. It's like a bloater always just happens. You never know it's coming. It's just, a, it's always a jump. Yeah, you know, <laughs> sure. Some of that stuff is a bit silly, and they switched up a little bit. My favorite encounter, though, is actually the, the one time they genuinely surprised me. I don't know if you guys had uh, triggered the encounter because I'm pretty sure it's optional, where you use a workbench and you get jumped. Yes, yes, yes. I liked that yes. one. That was that good. was that was fantastic, actually, yeah. for a few reasons. I explicitly had mentioned to Stacy that um, workbenches are safe places where the game is not mean enough to, oh, wow. uh, to throw good. encounters to you. And then lo and behold, in the next few hours of gameplay, that happened. And also, those people mistook you for wolves that were hunting yeah. them down because they're yeah. deserters. Yes. Yeah. That is a good little mini story. And yeah. there wasn't enough of that during Ellie's thing. And there also wasn't enough of Ellie having self-awareness. And that's part of what I think is interesting. Like, some of it is too subtle, like the trading cards. Um, and, and, and I don't mean too subtle in a bad way. I mean, it's too subtle for to, for me to expect Ellie to understand that she is that card right now that is marked as a villain. Yeah. Um, it's kind of weird that uh, they do so much to put these notes all over the world to try and give you that backstory. And she, and ever, she never takes anything from it, right? Barely. Um, which, which, which is actually really interesting because when you switch to Abby and her collectible, which are coins that she collected with her dad, mm-hmm. you know, she mentions it and she, it's a, it's a way more interesting sort of connection to her story than these, like, tr- like you kind of know where they come from because of, you know, Joel and Ellie, but there's never any commentary on it. They're just sort of just there. They're not explained in the narrative real in any real way, where I think when you're Abby, you get a little bit more. From the notes or from the um, I mean, just from the backstory alone, just from your introduction to... As far as why she collects them? Yeah, and your, oh, your introduction okay. to well, Jerry. I think the Jared. first game talks to more about why she collects those things. A little bit. She's just yeah. she's just a fangirl, and this game yeah. acknowledges it too. Like Jesse pokes at her, uh, makes fun of her for like being a autocon basically. Uh, when they see the poster for the for the conference, and yes. he was like, "Oh, it's for people who like well the stuff you like," and yeah, like that that's enough of a reason to collect the thing. And in some ways, it is honestly a commentary on collectibles because a lot of those collectibles are really taking you out of the mindset of a gamer. I think they could mm-hmm. anyway of like, I need to collect all the things and a bit more into the mindset of this card is labeled as a villain. This sounds like Ellie or such and such character. Right? Yeah. I think it takes me out more so because it pads the game time too. Cause now I've got to spend, mm-hmm. Time I was for pouring that. over these more expansive spaces, looking that was, for the trading cards. That was honestly I guess it was different for me through. because I felt I felt me collecting coins as Abby was there was a connection to um, Jerry dad. as opposed to Ellie's connection to Joe would be the guitar. Like right. every like me trading and uh, getting trading cards didn't really connect me to the reason of revenge. Not saying that it needed to, but I think sure. that the coin and her dad thing connected more and al- always sort of sitting down and playing with the guitar before you left or the guitars that you found in the world made paid more homage to the relationship between Ellie and Joel. Yeah. I do so, really like the trading like the cards mechanic, is just like that. 
Yeah. The guitar yeah. is really the guitar cool. Is so I, I, I actually have a save point set at the one at the music store, the one in the theater, just for the sake of like, I oh, actually made a third. I made a third save point for playing fetch with uh, Bear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Because I was just enjoying throwing the ball and him bringing it back. Adorable. But I did it I twice did... and then I was like, nah, Abby needs to move on. <laughs> I, yeah. I, uh, but I have been playing with the guitar a lot. I actually found the tabs for uh, Johnny Cash is Hurt because someone played it on a YouTube video. They showed them playing it on Ellie's guitar. Wow. And I was like, you know what? That one seems reasonable and in universe is yeah. uh, the, the yeah. depth to be part of it. Yeah. I was like, let's try that one. And I did. I, and it's fun. <clears throat> I wonder if like an extra or save, they have like some extra where they just have sort of Ellie in different environments sitting on a chair that you can access, like you beat the game or something like that. That would be fascinating. That would I mean, be good to see cool. as like a menu yeah. like option, right? Like as yeah, opposed yeah. to Extras. viewing like Extras. Well, when the event like when that. the eventual PC port comes out, I'm sure someone will mod that in of like, they'll just Is that take, something they said they're going to do? Uh, no, but I mean, okay. is, aren't, isn't Sony making a general push to like PC ports or doing Horizon? I'm just saying, if oh, that yeah, ever right. happens. Yeah, there's Horizon's coming to PC. Oh, yeah, Horizon's Horizon coming to... again, you guys? No, you're just going to wait for the second one. Stop. Uh, uh, probably, because I'm, consider I'm, I'm considering I'm going to play it with too. a Steam controller. <laughs> anyway, uh, back to Last of Us Part 2. Uh, I think we're close to wanting to wrap up, and yes. yeah. I wanted to close my last thoughts with one perspective that I haven't explicitly talked about. I play a lot of games and watch a lot of TV always with this one particular lens. What is this story doing in terms of promoting values, and is that thing good? Revenge and a lot bad. of my and a lot of my hesitation with the reviews that I encountered and stuff, or just a critique early on, was, oh, I think this game is going to be shit on that front. I think I'm wrong. I think that this game does good. I think that it's a bit heavy-handed about it, and I look forward to ending it. I think that actually, like most of my problem with the game is in that front uh, third, maybe of it. Mm -hmm. I think it gets progressively better. Uh, it starts strong. I'm excited to see how it ends. And this is not a simplistic depiction at the point that I'm up to of revenge and how it happens and the people involved and how groups are formed and dissolve and how groups go to war with each other and all of that. It's not a simple depiction, and that's good. We'll see where it lands in terms of how I feel like it actually rewards or punishes certain characters and therefore is promoting or not promoting certain things. It might end up just ending on a big old bang of just everyone's horrible and that would feel incredibly unsatisfying mm -hmm. to me, but mm -hmm. we shall see. I think from there, I think for me right now, it's gonna, it's heavily dependent on this next section where I'm starting to play as Abby and they give me the side of the wolves to see if this game can change how I feel about it and how I feel about how its narrative is going. Because right now I'm kind of in the middle ground. Is it above average? Yes. Is it always, is it good storytelling? Yes. Is the story simple? Yes. Is there like a, to me, is it interesting? Not really right now. Mm. Not really. But maybe, just maybe they can spin me by giving me the other side of the story. Mm. And I think that's where I'm going to find out if I love love this game or if I just think, hey, this is The Last of Us Part 2. Yeah. Um, I mean, as the only person here who's finished the game, I think that there's definite, you there's definitely you need to finish the game to see, you know, whether or not those um, sort of hypotheses hold up. Mm -hmm. um, I found just like a general sense. I have, I have to be the most careful out of all three of us. I found that the mechanics heavily disrupted the flow for me. Um, I just think that I, it's not a game that really connected with me mechanics wise. And I just found, you know, encounters to be too long, enemies to be too plentiful. And it really hindered me from like sort of getting in and enjoying the game. I did find some of the character decisions to do certain things just like, hmm, Lock okay. Um, I, I understand where you're coming from. And, you know, I, I made all these excuses of like, well, in this world, you know, it's not like Ellie can talk to a mental health professional, you know, yeah. she just has to deal with it and do it. And, you know, think of yourself, how would you deal with it with this sort of simplified, you know, structure of justice and law and order and what you think is justice and what is actual justice and the things you're willing to, to get this justice completed. So 
you know, like you said, Zavi, I don't want to go like, oh, everybody's bad and this is stupid. However, I think there is some internal consistency that we look for in characters. And when I said, you know, let's think of the previous, I mean, I'm not saying like, you know, there's a side games and side lores and listening to interviews about character, you know, um, characteristics of a character that you don't need to. However, there is something to be gleaned from the history of a character, mm-hmm. her relationships that are um, sort of explored in, in the game, mm-hmm. and, then the, and then the reasons that they continue to go through certain things. One small mm-hmm. thing, I think this game, as I said to you guys before, ha- has the <clears throat> Last Jedi problem, where there's a problem with scale. And I think that's where a lot of the criticism comes from this game. The first game sort of gives you these false stakes of like, this is the end of the world scenario, or like your, your um, view into this story, if you complete it, you change the stakes of the entire universe of this world. Right. This game completely negates that and just says, well, that failed. Now we're just going to do something personal. And I think going from this huge meta story to this small personal story also affects people in the way of just like, yeah. Well, I just, I'm not that's really kinda, invested that much. That's kind of like, how I from, felt yeah. about it. Going into I, it with the jump off from it just being a revenge story for me, I was just like, you know, the way the stakes were in the first game, I expected something kind of close to that. Whether it was um, on that scale or just a little below it, I didn't mm-hmm. expect them to shrink down this scale down to just, mm-hmm. hey, you killed yeah. my dad. I think also personally and probably because Jackson and the stadium are not involved. Right. It's like yes. those things are wholly just sort of ignored in the sense of like, well. This game well, has an individualism problem. Yeah. But, but, however, I do think in the beginning when Maria talks to you, and who's mm-hmm. like, did, I, I forgot her position, but she seems like she's the leader of the Jackson settlement. Correct. Yeah. She's yeah. kind of okay. she's, she's that kind of the, leader. Okay. Yeah. So, so I think it was handled there in the sense of like, she's like, okay, I'm the leader I'm giving you permission to do this and you can kind of feel like if you don't get it done, that's it. Like that, that's it. Like Jackson is not dissolving our society. Mm-hmm. You know, I, yeah. I think you understand that this means and, that if you're going, you're going rogue and that's sort of it. And, and I will say that that's not necessarily inherently a problem. I'm okay with the focus of a story being its characters in some ways yeah. that is, necessary for empathy if you tried to tell the story of jackson versus stadium as a hypothetical it you'd ha- you'd have the problem of how do i make them give a shit about such and such characters well but, i meant as far as my critique of there being a sc- scale problem and yes. the stakes of just a, like she can do this without any stakes problem a yeah. lot of games suffer from this it's a tricky thing to, to to really nail but like a lot of games use as a crutch in my opinion the fate of the world mm-hmm. as right. the player motivation Thing. But you I also think need, you say the you fate need... of a community is a little bit more personable and not, yes. you know, like no zero, like not a zero sum, just like but the fate I of my say, community. Regardless of how this game ends, I do take this as the fate of the community because it's absolutely in universe that this revenge cycle can consume an entire people. It doesn't need to be um, the world is at stake every time. But it also, it's also not something that should just be like, well, this is just an Ellie problem. Well, I, I think I would put it this way. It's not the state, it's not the, the, the fate of the world, and that's okay. It is the fate of Ellie's soul. I guess if you're going to dig that far. <laughs> I, I, I do. I do, actually. I think well, the, game is, the game is asking that question, to too. Finish though. the game. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, the, the, game, the game, I think the last thing, the truly last thing that I'll say is I do, I do think the game is interested in that. There's all these little clues here and there about, like, what is Ellie turning into? And there's this yeah. whole thing in all zombie fiction, which this is kind of a part of, about, like, losing your humanity due to the state of the world. And this is okay as being part of that conversation. It's just a little heavy-handed. Um, and yeah, we'll see where we land. Um, sure. So I guess when we come back to the topic at some point in the future, because once everybody's finished, I'm sure we'll come back to it. Yeah. Uh, we can now give our fully formulated opinions, because at, at the point we're at right now, we are, I mean, Mikey's finished the only one that finished the game. I'm about halfway through, and Zavi, you're probably closer to the end. I yeah. might... So if if I can stay awake, I might try to finish it today. We'll see. Oh, well, I, I'm I probably not going to be done for a while, considering how, like during the week, I'm just I can't I don't have the mental capacity to play it during the week. It's hard, yeah. and it's yeah. it's pretty like rough game to just sit down and get into and just kind of play only half an hour. 
especially yep. because it's so padded out with encounters. But um, I might take a little longer to finish it than you guys. Yeah. So I think we'll table. I the ended up putting it on very light, Steve, and finishing it about yeah. um, maybe about halfway through Abby's. I was like, "Fuck this bullshit." Like, I might be operating I'm, on too much good faith, where I'm like, "No, I want to stay on hard difficulty and have the game make me feel like." So do you think it's thing. fair to table the discussion until like I finish it, right? That way you can. I mean, it's not. You final. both can collect yeah, 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 collect absolutely. your thoughts, yeah. and then you know I'll have my thoughts at the end of it, and we can see where Take we all your time. landed, yeah. you know, at the end of it, and then I think. Uh, Next week, we're going to return to normal form. Uh, video game news, what we're yeah, playing we'll besides The Last of Us, whatever stuff. we go. Because, I, you know, this, the Steam summer sale is going on. So uh, I've I bought Sonic and, and Sega part. All-Stars Racing Transformed, and I've been loving it. I actually yeah, bought um, four games yesterday. I bought um, Gunfire Reborn. I bought Islanders. I bought uh, Return of the Obra Dinn. Ah. Uh. I've been and it. scrap mechanic. Return of the Redin is really neat. I think I'll talk about it next week. I mean, cool. oh, nice. I look forward to hearing about that. Yeah. Uh, the, his his previous game, Papers Please, fucking masterpiece. Love Papers in my Please. Opinion. Paper Please is great. Uh, I played right. that. Uh, anyway, game, that's uh, your sneak preview of yeah. next week's, next week's discussion. Party chat peoples. <laughs> Who wants to take us out? Mike, you take oh. us out. Uh, I've never done the taking us out thing, but so I guess. Do it. <laughs> Not that hard. Well, that's it for today, folks. Don't forget to like, comment, us. and subscribe. Of course, and you can catch <laughs> us on our socials on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, where we'll be updating episodes regularly. Stay tuned for our next episode, and see ya. Bye. Bye, everybody.